Welcome to another edition of Top Lines and Tales. This week we're sponsored by Harbro, manufacturers and suppliers of quality livestock nutrition. Continuing with our modern livestock series, we take a slightly different turn this week when we look a bit deeper into animal science and its impact on the industry. It's a great pleasure to speak to my guest this week, a man who has had a long and pioneering career in animal science, Professor John Robertson, formerly of the Rowett Institute in Aberdeen. Welcome, John. Very welcome. Thank you. And John, you don't sound quite like a local in Aberdeen there. Where was home to you originally? County Down. In the East, the Morn Mountains, sheep country. The family farm you involved in sheep yourself back then? And it's still run by my bachelor brother. You watch the vet programs from Morn Vets, you'll see his vets out on the farms in Northern Ireland. And what livestock were you involved with in, in a young age? Were you on the farm yourself? Yes, yeah, um, beef cattle and uh, sheep, a mixed arable. And where did you go to college then? John, what got you into animal science? What made a farmer jump the fence into, into science and then go on to become a professor? What's, what's the story there? Well, obviously, there was only 120 acres of land and three sons, and I wasn't the first one. And uh, it was clear that there wasn't going to be much of a place for me there. Um, so there was a bigger world of agriculture that I thought I could get into. I didn't feel I had the brains for a vet. I had to leave that to the next generation. Um, I needed a mother to infuse some intellect into the into the family, I think. And um, as a result, um, I went to Queen's and did agriculture and then got into research and then worked with vets all my life. The Queen's being in Belfast? Belfast, yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And then you went on to join the Rowett Institute. Have I missed a bit out there before? Down to England. I couldn't get a job to begin with. Nobody wanted me. You get to a stage where you know too much uh, about too little to be any good to anybody. <laughs> so uh, eventually, uh, well, I then came up to Aberdeen. And I was really lucky in many ways because nobody wanted to come to Aberdeen at that time. There are lots of good people. that have advertised the job three times and nobody would take it because it wasn't an, uh, you know, you had no great uh, shows um, and, and the cultural world came to Aberdeen. They didn't think I would really stay, but but I did. When was that, John? 1968. And, and Rowett has a long history, I know, and it would be hugely important in the world of livestock research even back then. Can you tell me a bit more about what oh. goes on at Rowett and what it stands for? Oh, it was so immensely important at that particular time. Its main remit was human and animal nutrition. And of course, its first director Jen, was Boyd Orr, Lord Boyd Orr. And he had been a teacher. Uh, he had to teach because he had got a, a scholarship to university in Glasgow and he had to teach for three years to fulfill um, the scholarship. Um, and... Um, he, he came to the conclusion that was, his children were so badly fed in the, the uh, poor states of Glasgow um, that he couldn't teach them until they were fed. So he went back and he did a double degree in medicine and phys- animal physiology and human physiology. And um, uh, he, he was still a student, a PhD student, whenever he was appointed director of the Rod. And you'd be part of a team of scientists uh, who would all be renowned in their own right there. Can you give us some background well, on we, some of your fellow colleagues we, that you had? There? We, we came in at that particular time. Yes, there was uh, the riot at, at that time, just before me, you see, it had had um, Singh had worked on it in chromatography and a Nobel Prize winner. I even had the honour of them uh, buying us as a group of poor students uh, down at the local here in, in Buxburn, uh, a bottle of Glen Morangi. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, of course, he went on then to uh, food at Norwich and, and further things. Um, the riot was a remarkable place for having wonderful technical staff who could take the most complex description uh, from a scientific paper of a procedure and put it into operation and make it work. And that was why the world and everybody came to the riot. It was amongst the first to uh, pioneer the uh, use of cannulae in animals, which really uh, ended up in colostomy in humans and 
all that side of things. It, it was a, a real first uh, and one that people in the Northeast should know more about and be proud of. And so they should. And uh, you covered a multitude of subjects there. Weren't you involved with the initial work on embryo transfer, John? It's very interesting. Embryo transfer, the first embryo transfers in sheep in the world had been carried out by a PhD student with Hammond in, um, down in Cambridge. And he went back to South Africa and uh, he um, put the, uh, the sheep embryos into the oviducts of uh, rabbits and took them out with him on the plane with his pet rabbits. Oh. And uh, then took the, uh, the fertilized eggs back out and uh, put them into sheep. Wow. The first time. So you see the reputation that, that it had in all aspects of animal production, particularly strong on you know, the rumen and the microbes, the protozoa, and all that was new science. It certainly was. And uh, of course, all that early work done on embryo transfer eventually went on and changed the pedigree livestock industry beyond all recognition and uh, still a valuable part of our industry today. And roughly when was that, uh, John? The, the early work, early 70s, that was taking place. But um, the, the, the staff from the RAD were very much in, you know, wanted throughout the world. Reg Preston, who um, with Aki Manson had sort of developed barley beef here. That had all uh, led to an industry throughout the world. And of course, um, he was wanted then out at Cuba, but Fidel Castro wanted him to set up a, an industry based on barley beef. Um, and he said, no, I'll base it, base it on um, sugar. So it was a case of sort of um, the barley beef man uh, melted into sugar uh, and molasses and what. And a lot of the procedures that, uh, were subsequently you know, honed and changed and the principles used be used in Harbo like maximum and but again that was the famous Bob Orskov and you had Frank Elsley one of the youngest professors in animal science who went off to Edinburgh he was head of uh, pig production he went off to um, Edinburgh and he became um, he became well, well known for doing experiments throughout all the experimental husbandry farms and universities and colleges. We had Vernon Fowler, an expert in postnatal growth and development in animals, which is putting new insight into the whole of how, how you should be feeding and what you should be putting in a diet to maximize lean tissue production. You had Carpenter along with uh, Arthur Jones, uh, who discovered a lysine, uh, and how to produce it synthetically. And uh, one of the sad sides of that story, he was uh, in charge of Isaac Spencer's. Um, Isaac Spencer's knew that blood meal was high in lysine and the best source of lysine and cheapest source was to bring it in from Canada as dried blood meal. He brought in large stacks of this. Uh, then the, uh, the science and the riot discovered how to produce it synthetically along with Ellinger, um, who is a um, Hungarian refugee who had come to work at the Rod. Um, and uh, Isaac Spencer's went bust, oh. sadly. And then you had a Norvite, uh, which was developed by two people that you probably know. There was uh, Matheson, who farms up here in the Northeast, Roy Matheson and his colleague. But um, they established that complete new information package for the ruminant and pig industries and indeed the poultry industry. And can I just step back to the embryo transfer work of my podcast uh, is very much involved around the pedigree world. Were you personally involved in the embryo transfer work at Rowett itself? Yeah, yeah well, we developed it all with the riot, that and the intrauterine insemination by laparoscopy and uh, we developed by Bill McKelvey, became our own, our own director here at and of course, Arthur Jones went on to be a uh, principal of Sarncester uh, down in England. What happened then was the industry thereafter drove it. They wanted it. They could see the potential. And um, the leading breeders like the Mares, the uh, Sandy Campbell, Jimmy Douglas um, and Sandy Lee all became very, you get phone calls from 
uh, from them at all times. We ran um, the big centre, which we brought the animals in. They're even coming up from England, the Charleys. Would I be right in thinking some of the breakthroughs in uh, embryo transfer stem from the work that had been done on Maida Visna? And John, I think that's something else you were involved in and a huge problem back then, wasn't it? Uh, and initially, Maida Visna, which we still have in this country, is still a danger. Maida Visna came in because they thought they were safe in bringing um, the taxol from, obviously, the Isle of Taxol. They thought they would be, they would, they would be safe in bringing them in from France. And they weren't. And a, a good colleague of mine uh, through university uh, connections had brought in some ewes to Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And he said, when you are, you can take a holiday and come over and do that. I know you would enjoy being over here. And um, I took all the equipment from the rod over. Nobody knew that I was doing that. And well, nobody of in charge of the institute here was doing that. And we transferred embryos along with uh, colleagues from research that I had worked with uh, in Dublin University and elsewhere in the South. So you really were right there in the beginning with that uh, with that embryo work. And, and another um, subject that I believe you were involved in um, uh, in the earlier days was the cloning of uh, Dolly the sheep. And obviously she went on to become a household word and something that our listeners would love to hear about. So can you give me a bit more information about what went on there with the cloning? I had known Ian Wilmot in uh, the 70s. In fact, Ian Wilmot applied for a job in our department, the rod, and was turned down. <laughs> um, but he produced the first uh, calf, Frosty, from frozen semen. He produced the first long life uh, boar semen, which is the only way I think um, sows are gotten and pig currently. And uh, he always maintained that he hadn't achieved anything. He still had a lot to, to do, yet he was going to be sacked because there was no future. Uh, it was really a political thing that Cambridge, uh, who were the, the big names under Hammond and all the, the family that he had brought in from over, over the world and educated and taught, there was, uh, there was no chance uh, of getting involved in that. But what interested me and the Northeast uh, and uh, the researchers here like Peter Broadbent and Kevin Sinclair and that uh, was you could go to the slaughterhouse and take um, the ovaries from beef heifers, wonderful beef animals, and you could culture them in the lab and put the embryos into um, cows, the, the Holstein Frisian and get wonderful beef. Mm -hmm. And that seemed really great. And they set up a company from Cambridge, Cambridge Biotech up here, and built an environmentally controlled lab, produced them, and they were producing them in uh, Ireland as well. But every so often you got these animals that were massively overgrown at birth. Uh, the, the, the cows were too big to be born. And uh, it became a welfare issue and it all had to be stopped. Um, I became involved at that time because I had uh, looked at fetal growth and development from a mathematical point of view with the help of very uh, first class mathematicians and statisticians at the Rod. And I had got up in a number of meetings um, in Ireland and elsewhere and said that, uh, that the first 10 days of a pregnancy in any mammalian species, ourselves included, was critical to the size, uh, our size at birth. And if, if, the, if we got fast growth then, we were going to be born very big and usually by cesarean section because uh, there was excess progesterone being produced at that time. And of course, in embryo transfer, we were stimulating to increase ovulation rate. You're getting more ovulations, more corporal atm formed in the ovary and more progesterone. So that's how I got, became involved in that. And, and, and indeed, we were the first then to go on and use some of the farmers I own stock here to produce the first identical twins. And, and, and that was a great boost to be doing experiments because you only needed two animals to prove a point mm -hmm. that something worked or didn't work. Uh -huh. and, and with regards to Dolly the sheep, she became a household word. And uh, I saw her recently in a museum in Edinburgh, but obviously it sparked some ethical de debates in, in the world's media. Did, did that get to, to you guys? Did, did you realize what, uh, what impact this would have? 
Yes, we did. Uh, it was worry. But uh, Ian Wilmot, of course, who's he had fa- fa- father who suffered debilitating uh, inherited disease. So of course, uh, he played a big part in in live um, interviews with Jeremy Paxman and what have you at Newsnight to inform. Them. Public that his intentions were entirely honourable and for the best interests of humankind. And once Dolly had, had been done, then there were others. I mean, she's the one that's known, but they carried on producing a, a whole load more uh, Dolly 2 and 3 and 4. And, and, uh... and my colleague, uh, he was a student here, Aberdeen, he worked with us, Ke- Kevin Sinclair, his brother is um, prof of new uh, family nutrition at um, Harbour Adams. He published all that data to show that, uh, as we knew perfectly well, that the disease that she died of, um, largely lung disorder, cancer as they called it, and, and the arthritic conditions were all due to the way she had to be kept indoors all the time, lack of exercise, and that uh, she had picked up from animals black faces and grey faces and uh, our own animals that were buying in for the large number of animals we were using in experiments, they all were dying with this disease as well. Okay. And was it a bit like the Apollo mission? Did that sort of come to a stop after that or did the cloning carry on in, in other societies? Or, or how did it impact agriculture? I suppose that's the question I'd like to ask. Well, the... I mean, others have benefited from it. I mean, the the, the last surviving cow in uh, Anglebury Island uh, in, in, in the South Pacific was cloned um, by uh, Neil Evans, who, who was a student of Ian's at um, Edinburgh at Rosalind. Um, you had uh, West Coast, and they had a, a bull that was, uh, uh, he was resistant to either TB or uh, brucellosis, and uh, I'm not sure which, but they had no tissue in him and they, they, they had semen from him and the container it was in imploded. And um, Mark West, Houston, who I met out there, um, unknowingly, I suppose, uh, seeded the idea that cloning could be possible uh, from um, when Ian Wilmot visited him. So, yes, there was great benefits could accrue from it. I mean, they haven't done as yet and, and mean. Well, given the current situation and beef consumption and all the rest of it, sadly, they, they may not, of course. Mm. And did the cloning research spill over into the into the human medical side? No, no, no. I, well, uh, the Newcastle University, and again, they were colleagues of ours, trained at the RAT, the production of the first human baby, and I think they're allowed to continue it, uh, free of mitochondrial DNA comes from the egg outside the nucleus. And it causes a lot of our genetic defects. Uh-huh. I wasn't suggesting that they were going on to produce clones on a commercial scale, but it's nice to know that that uh, technology from the cloning there is being used uh, um, to help the human race. They're using the principle of the clone in that, yeah. Can I move on a, a little bit, John? You said you were involved in the studying of fetal growth in lambs, I believe, and defining protein requirements in later in pregnancy. I used to breed Beltex sheep, so this is critical to a lot of farmers about how we, you know, how much protein at what time in the cycle we should and shouldn't be uh, feeding additional protein. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit for us, uh, John, please? Well, of course, at that particular time, I mean, I came to the rod thinking that the best protein of all was fish meal. Um, but what I, I hadn't realized, well, uh, I had used soybean meal in all my research as a, a student, and um, I would have regarded it as more palatable and uh, per unit of protein more valuable. And, uh, of course, uh, that wasn't the situation up here. Yeah, you had a farming community that were feeding it, and they kept on saying, ah, they shock their heads, John, they shock their heads when they're born. And that's the first thing anybody wants to see if a lamb is going to survive. Sure. They've got their vitality and growth and up and go. Mm-hmm. So, we, you know, we're doing our best to try and keep that vitality in newborn lambs and calves alive. Um, but um, and, and there's a whole research package behind that involving iodine, selenium, and the trace elements and all the things that you would be incorporating into your diets and licks. And there's uh, different key stages of the cycle, aren't there? But uh, uh, generally, diet would be hugely influential on the profitability of uh, all flocks. Oh, 
very, 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 very much yeah, so. A lot of the research you carried out there would have condensed down into good practical advice to the farmer, couldn't it? Can you sort of pick out some of the key stages in the production cycle that would have the, the biggest influence on, on, the, on the livestock? That's a difficult question, but the biggest issue would, would really be listening to farmers as to when they had first noticed that things needed, were changing. And could these be diet effects, environmentally enhanced effects? What was causing this? And we're going to be living with that more and more with the climate change of today. I mean, this year you will still be feeding supplementary feed to use. You wouldn't have expected to be feeding to them. The one thing that I think we missed out on terribly, when I came here, you were expected to lecture to students, do research and interact with farmers. And I found it quite difficult to interact with the farmers. and I couldn't understand their language. People in the Northeast, like um, big um, pedigree sheep breeders, like um, Sam Forrest and that, on the phone one day and he said, Sean, I've got one of the best lambs I've ever produced. And it was a good one, obviously, in his eyes, because he had sold um, um, a 5 8 Classic for 10,000 guineas to Sandy Lee, all the way to hell on his wheelies. And uh, that's what he meant it was off his legs. <laughs> wheelies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid all of us do find it a little bit uh, hard to understand in Aberdeenshire, yeah. but I won't be I won't be rude about it. I think uh, I uh, read the word epigenetics uh, recently with regards to uh, to cattle and sheep. Can you explain to me a little bit uh, what that's about? Um, uh, it was poor thinking, bad reasoning, and all that goes with um, bad science to be thinking that the environment affected the way we lived and our animals behaved. Um, they, it was only the Russians that believed that. Um, so the confusion really only came from the fact, uh, in principle, it sounded like, although it wasn't this, but it sounded very like as if you ducked the tail of a lamb often enough, then there would, there would come a, a generation that would, wouldn't have a tail. But... The, that wasn't the, the case at all. The true fact was that the environment doesn't change our DNA. So therefore, it couldn't change whether lambs had or hadn't tails. But it, it changes the way it's expressed. You know, So you could do a DNA and say that's genetically identical to that. Uh, but that wasn't the case. It was the way it was expressed. And... That, that is what fooled everyone. Now, we then began to realize, because we were culturing embryos uh, for long periods so that we could transfer them by simple procedures into animals. I mean, you couldn't tell an animal, a cow, lie down there and I'll, you know, and I'll be about five minutes and I'll transfer an embryo into your ovator. You'll be fine. You could do that with humans in hospitals and that. Uh, and we, uh, but we couldn't do it, uh, and we couldn't do it with a laparoscope in sheep because we couldn't position, position them right into the fallopian tubes where we needed to for them to develop because it's a, it's a very strict temporal protocol that has to be kept between the, the time in the fallopian tubes that they will survive. And if they're too early, they are too advanced for that, which ours were, then uh, that environment can no longer sustain them. So what we then realized is that from that, uh, we discovered that there is, uh, from the oversized work, uh, with the thanks of Lorraine Young and a, a, a whole team of um, young molecular biologists, we found that the, the gene that was disrupted was the, uh, this is a bit technical, was one of the growth genes. It, it happened to be the receptor uh, for the one of the growth genes. So we could correct that, but by that time the industry had uh, moved on, and uh, the welfare people had got hold of it, and and you, you know we were never going to be able to go back and convince them that these were genuine errors, and uh, they always felt we would always be and science wouldn't be delivering what they wanted. But the things that control those are uh, a lot of the B vitamins and in particular in folic acid. And that's where the spina bifida and that come from. 
of course, now that allow you to do what's fine and buffet into human diets to prevent that. So B12 and things like choline, and this is why I got the choline into the diets for to get better gene expression, better uh, viability uh, throughout the, um, the reproductive cycle. And that carried right through those effects, similar to the effects on growth that we saw early on, those effects in the case of the epigenetic effect, the B vitamins and things like choline, betaine and what have you, they all carried right through uh, improvement, uh, which also uh, proved to be effective in increasing the milk yield of high yielding dairy cows, preventing ketosis in the uh, dairy cow industry. Uh-huh. The other one for that is methyl malonic acid, which is because of a lot of protein in it, branched chain fatty acids build up. And in lamb fattening, you get this soft fat, you get uh, very unacceptable tints and odors as a result of that. So that uh, with uh, eight of our chemists, biochemists and Bob Orskov solved that problem. Uh, and you then reduced the amount of processing of grain which then ensured that the papilla and the rumen developed well. And then you got the farmers who thought at one time your diets were wonderful and uh, they were putting in, were asking you, why do you not process it more and more and make it like chick feed? And we said, no, 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 do not do that. Um, uh, You'll destroy them. And of course, the one particular year in the late 90s, their prices completely slumped for their um, rams, they wouldn't eat the feed. You're talking about the processing of the feed here, and I think you're referring to your time when you worked uh, and still do uh, alongside Harborough. And uh, you teamed up, I think, with uh, Peter Kenyon around about the time that uh, that he took over the reins at, uh, at Harborough. And, of course, he, again, another Beltex breeder. Yeah, we're always in uh, contact with him. He had taken over from the Harry Gregson. Uh, he could make him file available to us at any time. And we were quite open with what we knew and what we did and what we were doing. And your association with Harbour would eventually lead to the development of their uh, clover range, which uh, went on to be one of the top feeds, uh, feeding all the top pedigree uh, sheep flocks, uh, not just in Aberdeenshire, but uh, right across the country. The the rat didn't seem to know what was going on. and uh, I think sort of said, John Robinson's too... um, he, he wouldn't do anything like that. So he got away, I think, I hope I got away with it. You were allowed to benefit from that. Yeah. And uh, you would go on to leave the rabbit, but you carried on your association with Harborough, didn't you? I think uh, uh, training the sales team on, on uh, nutrition as well. Yes, uh, Derek was one of the leaders of the organisation of getting that older. And Willie, I hope Willie gets better soon. Willie Thompson, of course, he's the technical director. John, we're moving on a little bit. I've got a lot of shepherds listening to this podcast. If they were to change one thing about the way they manage their flock nowadays, what would you say would have the biggest impact for them? Uh, I mean, obviously nutrition and breeding and all the rest comes. But I feel that we've lost stockmanship. We've stock ability to look and see when things are wrong. Uh, we can jump on quad bags. We fly through the field. Um, uh, and uh, we dump the food before the sheep have arrived to eat it. Some arrive quicker than others because they're fitter and younger, and they are down with acidosis the next morning. Despite all the efforts that we would have made in the past, which were successful, and then we um, we're in difficulty and in really helping the industry there. Yet it is just a, an inevitable movement into snacker feeding. Um, snacker feeding, w- which did in fact come before that, and maybe that caused the problem because uh-huh. it, it gave the impression that you couldn't go wrong. Mm. But you, you, you did go wrong. At least snacker feeding gave you the you showed that you had a certain amount and it was only at certain intervals that sheep could come, come and find it. And, uh, so they had all a greater opportunity coming in from a radius you okay. know, to one point. 
and a lot of this obviously is down to economics and and time and you know the biggest cost to any farmer nowadays is, is the is time in the day and as they get bigger and less and less labor of course these things kick in but that's great observation to it should be heeded by a lot of people all around yeah. um if we yeah, we move on to the now and the despite the best efforts of the scaremongers, the UK sheep business is uh, extremely buoyant just now. And everything. Can science take a bit of credit for that, John, for the fact the way the sheep is, industry is, is these days? Well, I took a lot of flack for it uh, in New Zealand in 1990. I was asked to speak on uh, the uh, pastoral animal industry as what it would be like in the 21st century. And I went through all the hard science of you know, gene transfer, and we wouldn't have scrapey and the laugh me out of, uh, off the platform uh-huh. and said, you're rubbish, you'll always have scrapey. Um, and, of course, within a year, we knew all about how to select against scrapey uh-huh. um, uh, and the genes involved in it, thanks to the Neuropathogenesis Unit and Jim Hope down in uh, Edinburgh, who I was friendly with. So, believe it or not, at that particular time, Global warming was a big thing. And Cam Reed, who had done, he had 56 uh, scientific papers on bloat in cattle. I said, we're really going to have to get our act together uh, in the pastoral animal industry. It's the most important thing is going to be not new pasture varieties as, as J.B. Hutton and, uh, and famously and controversially had said in, um, in New Zealand. So... They did get their act together. Um, they, they didn't have to make many adjustments. They didn't have much need for uh, fertilizer, so that wasn't a problem. And um, they got an over their bloat problem and, and all the rest of it by carefully allocating feed amounts mm. to sheep, you know, so that they weren't in cattle that they weren't over over um, grazing. I suppose on the science side, when we're talking about scientific achievement, we have to acknowledge the work at Invermay of George Davis, another great friend, um, who uh, discovered all the single genes per, for prolificacy in sheep, or virtually them all, apart from one or two produced and found by the Chinese. But, uh, um, and it sort of puts the whole of Science didn't become the god. It couldn't become the god that we thought it, it, it had become, but we couldn't still do without it. And that's always going to be, obviously, thankfully, the case. But it's very difficult when you have statements from Churchill and still living on saying you scratch the surface of science and all you get is more science. That doesn't um, convert people to the idea that we are not infallible. Are you saying that uh, maybe the science world made a few errors during your lifetime in, with involvement? Well, I think they need to guide the science world. The biggest mistake we made was we thought molecular biology um, was everything. And the molecular biologists, we allowed them to drive science. Space research would give us plenty of examples just to, to show uh, how unbelievably uh, competent uh, uh, science is. Okay. And John, you've retired now. Is the rowet still going? Is that still at the sharp end of animal research these days? No, the rowet, the rowet is a, a much smaller institution in a building uh, in Forester Hill, uh, the Rowett Research Institute. Well, maybe the research has moved elsewhere, but I'd like to think it's still uh, it's still carrying on and uh, and helping our industry uh, uh, both in the from the farming community and from the the, the feed side of it. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, Willie found that he had to go to America for a lot of the original research. Uh, That didn't mean that we hadn't the capability here of using that basic research from America. Mm -hmm. What we had, unfortunately, lost the institutional structure that I talked about earlier, you know, of teacher, advisor, researcher, for to bring it to the farming community. But we have to listen to young people and not dismiss the ideas. I'll never forget the day that wonderful student that uh, is now farming uh, buffalo um, walked in and he said, I've got three buffalo. Could you tell me where I'll get any more, John? I said, get rid of the three that you have and forget all about it. 
and go and farm a proper enterprise. But he was sensible, he went on, and uh, we should never dismiss young people. Sure. And we should give them every opportunity. That's a great example of that. And you're talking, of course, about Stevie Mitchell. Um, John, one thing I probably would ask is uh, we've just gone through a, a huge pandemic and obviously science and, uh, has brought us out of this with, uh, with the vaccinations that's now going on. Is there something we can learn, something we should better learn from, uh, from this COVID outbreak that's gone on? Yeah, it, there was a, a wonderful paper read at a, an international meeting held down in England uh, and it was given by a person with a PhD. She was very friendly uh, because she'd gone to Oxford and she had met Clinton's daughter. And she said, we should have been prepared for COVID, but we weren't in not a single way. So the warning was there, what, three years ahead. Wow. But I suppose if you're a young PhD student, uh, it's understandable that an older generation are likely to turn to you and say, oh, what does she know? John, I'm going to bring this one to a close and I uh, uh, greatly thank you for your time on this call and I think a lot of pedigree breeders will thank you for the work that you did initially with Harbro to bring the, the, the quality feeds that they now produce. Uh, John, thank you for taking your time to talk to me. That's fine, Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast, which was kindly sponsored by Harbro, suppliers of quality commercial and pedigree feeds and expert nutritional advice. Visit their website or find them on Facebook for more information. And while on the subject of Facebook, why don't you visit the Top Lines and Tales Facebook page, where you'll find photographs and more information to back up this episode.